Well, thank you for joining us today for the WPC 2019 Pre-Congress Webinar Series. Today's webinar will be looking at motor complications and treatment options. The program today is based on the Pre-Congress Session 3, which will occur on Tuesday, June 4th in Kyoto. For our friends who cannot join us in person, you now have access to some of the world's leading researchers and neurosurgeons for the next hour to hear about just a few of the most talked about topics today on motor complications and treatment options. This is just one hour, so we can't possibly cover it all. This is designed to give you just a taste and hopefully it will inspire you to do some reading on your own to learn more. For those of you attending WPC in Kyoto in June, you're still welcome to register for the in-person pre-Congress course and hear from these same speakers again in longer session where they'll be able to go into deeper dive on these topics. We wouldn't be here without our sponsors. So I want to really thank Kioa Kieran for making this webinar possible. Today, we're joined by three presenters. I'm Dr. Stuart Isaacson, uh, Director of the Parkinson's Disease and Movement Disorder Center of Boca Raton. We have Dr. Raj Power, the Laverne and Joyce Ryder Professor of Neurology at the University of Kansas Medical Center. And also we're joined by Dr. Simon Lewis, Professor of Cognitive Neuroscience at the Brain and Mind Center, University of Sydney in Australia. Raj, do you want to lead off? Sure. So uh, my topic uh, next week is going to be uh, really dyskinesia versus tremor, the realities of living with dyskinesias, clinical forms of dyskinesias, and how do we treat them. So dyskinesia is one of those involuntary movements in Parkinson's where we expect once patients go on levodopa, over time they'll most likely develop dyskinesias. The issue is just because someone's develops dyskinesias does not mean we are necessarily going to treat it uh, or it is necessarily bothersome for the patient. So we kind of look at some of those things. On the other end of the spectrum, uh, we have tremors when the patients are not treated or they're undertreated, they have more of the tremor, which is much more rhythmical as opposed to the dyskinesias, which are more non-rhythmical, purposeless, unpredictable uh, movements that occur. One of the challenges that happens between tremor and dyskinesias is that whether it's the patient or some of the clinicians too, uh, have difficulty separating tremor from dyskinesias. And what happens there is that if a patient is calling my office and saying, oh, my tremors are getting worse, uh, and if my nurse doesn't quite get the right message, uh, we might increase their medications and they may call back two days later saying, oh, my tremors are so much worse. That may give us an idea that, okay, the patient is really talking about dyskinesias rather than tremors. But that is one of the challenges we end up is trying to differentiate the tremor and the dyskinesias in some patients. Some patients, uh, even sitting in our clinic, may have both. They, they could have tremor as well as dyskinesias. Uh, and on the other hand, they may go from tremors to dyskinesias within seconds, which itself is another challenge. If you look at the prevalence of dyskinesias, uh, as I mentioned earlier, it increases over time. So if you look at the studies, it may be about less than 10% at the first year to up to 90% after 10 to 15 years. So the thing is, once the people go on levodopa, they will most likely develop these dyskinesias. Now, of course, we know there are certain risk factors such as younger age, longer disease duration, uh, longer levodopa therapy, higher doses of levodopa, et cetera. All of these are risk factors for dyskinesias. One of the concerns often patients and clinicians have is that they feel if they delay the levodopa, uh, the dyskinesias may be delayed too. But the issue happens is that delaying the levodopa, the disease severity is worse, the disease duration is longer, and hence they are much more likely to develop the dyskinesias. We have multiple studies that have shown now that how significantly these dyskinesias can impact our patients. So we did a, a post hoc analysis on our clinical trials where we looked at different ADLs and found out that one of the most common thing patients had is uh, being in social settings. They were very embarrassed to be out there being in social setting. And in, in fact, over 70% of the patients felt that 
the dyskinesia has affected them being in the social situation. A similar number of patients found the gait and balance being affected. And then you go down into it, the dressing being affected was reported by about 60%, handwriting being affected by 60%, hygiene about 47%. So the important point is we often underestimate how bothersome the dyskinesias can be because we often talk to our patients and say, would you rather have dyskinesias or would you rather be off? Well, if you give the patient the two choices, most of them are going to pick dyskinesias versus being off. But the ideal situation is where they could be on without the dyskinesias or without being off. And the other thing is that due to the concerns of the dyskinesias, often our patients are undertreated, whether it is the patients themselves not want to go on treatment or the physicians being a little concerned that if they try too much of the medicine, then the dyskinesias could come on or the dyskinesias could get worse. So when we try to assess why a patient develops dyskinesias, we believe it's not only a dopaminergic issues, but also another uh, neurotransmitter such as glutamate may be playing a role in the development of the dyskinesias. And that's why it is important because if we reduce their levodopa, if we reduce their Parkinson's medications, which we often do when the patient develops the dyskinesias, the results end up happening is the patient is more Parkinsonian, the patient is more off. So are there ways we can get across where we can treat our patients with medications without actually worsening their Parkinson's or without worsening their uh, Parkinson's symptoms or reducing their medications? And one of the things is using medications uh, which have other neurotransmitter functions such as uh, NMDA antagonists have been shown to be very helpful for the dyskinesias. And if you go back and look at it, uh, amantadine, which is a very old medication and has been used in multiple small studies, have shown that the dyskinesias can be improved with amantadine, which is the immediate release amantadine. However, large studies were never done to assess how much better a patient can get with amantadine because these were much smaller studies uh, in patients who are 10, 20, 30 uh, number of patients. Often these were open label, uncontrolled studies. But the bottom line is that amantadine does help dyskinesias. So uh, when another compound was being developed, which is ADS5102, which is really a form of an extended amantadine, and this amantadine is given at bedtime. And using this at bedtime, it basically doesn't have any rise in the amantadine levels for about four or five hours at night. And then the levels gradually increase. So when the patient actually wakes up, the amantadine levels are at its peak. So they have improvement throughout the day. And as the day goes down, that's when the levels start going down. So that gives the patient control of dyskinesias throughout the day. Well, there were uh, studies done, phase three studies, looking at amantadine ER at bedtime for dyskinesias, and not only did it reduce the dyskinesias, but it also reduced off time. And in fact, in the United States, it was the first medication that was approved for levodopa-induced dyskinesias. So when we look at actually increase in on time, because it was a sum of reduction in dyskinesias plus off time, there was a significant improvement in, off time, in good on time uh, due to the reduction in both off time as well as troublesome dyskinesias. So if you look at other medications, well, there are other medications being tested, but right now, if you look at medications, we really are looking at carbidopa, levodopa, enteral suspension, or epimorphine infusion. Uh, the challenges with these medications when we look at their trials has been that these patients took patients who are, I mean, these studies took patients who are off rather than all of them having dyskinesias. So the main efficacy endpoint was reduction in off time. But if you look at their secondary one, even though they had very little troublesome dyskinesias, both infusion therapies were able to reduce the dyskinesias in these patients. So that is an advanced therapy that can be used in patients 
if reducing their Parkinson medication makes them more off, or amantadine or amantadine ER is not helpful for them. The another uh, therapy that is very effective for dyskinesias is, of course, deep brain stimulation. So when you look at deep brain stimulation, that significantly reduces not only the severity of dyskinesias, but also the number of hours the patient has during the day with the dyskinesias. And both subthalamic nucleus stimulation as well as GPS stimulation have shown a reduction in dyskinesias. So if I were to kind of summarize what I'm saying is, it is, first of all, important to uh, differentiate between tremor and dyskinesias. When we actually look at treatment of dyskinesias, reduction in the Parkinson medicine is one of the most commonly used ways that we are trying to reduce the dyskinesias. However, the price we pay is worsening of Parkinson's. Hence, amantadine and amantadine ER are a couple of medications which have been shown to be effective for reducing dyskinesias with the amantadine ER showing that it also reduces off time. Using advanced therapies such as epimorphine infusion, carbidopa, levodopa, enteral suspension, deep brain stimulation are the other treatment options for dyskinesias. Next week, we'll go into more details about these therapies. Stu? That was great, uh, Raj. So let me ask you a question. So you're pointing out that there's now new medications that may work on non-dopamine pathways. That's very different than how we've viewed Parkinson's over the years of trying to increase and lower dopamine therapies. Do you think that this is something that would be widespread for most people or is, is these new medicines only for, for a few people? No, I, I think we have focused on dopaminergic, uh, dopamine as a neurotransmitter for years. Uh, not only have we ignored the other neurotransmitters, uh, but we know the other neurotransmitters play a very important role, not only in the dyskinesia part, but also whether we are looking at cognitive issues, we are looking at psychosis, we are looking at depression, anxiety, orthostatic hypertension. So Parkinson's is not purely a dopaminergic issue. It involves multiple other neurotransmitters. We know glutamate is one where we can change dyskinesia as clearly shown in the study. There are other pathways such as serotonin. Maybe you know we may have results down the road with those drugs that they may also reduce dyskinesias. We may have uh, Marinol uh, receptors or marijuana receptors down the future, which may also reduce dyskinesias. So I think I'm hopeful that in the years ahead, we will have improvement looking at medications with other neurotransmitters, including glutamate. Great. Well, that's very uh, interesting, and uh, we'll look forward to hearing more about this in Kyoto. Let's turn now to Professor Lewis in Australia, and I think he's going to talk a little bit about some emergency treatment options for Parkinson's disease and give us a preview of his uh, lecture in Kyoto. Uh, thank you, Agata. Konnichiwa. Uh, good morning, everybody, or good evening, depending on where you are in the world watching the uh, the webinar. Looking forward to seeing everyone in Kyoto uh, next week. So um, my uh, presentation in Kyoto uh, will be targeting Parkinson emergencies. Uh, now, Parkinson uh, emergencies, I realize the first Parkinson emergency that I face is that Raj seems to have far more medical certificates than I do. Um, I, I, I can see just how, how impressive he is as well as on the program. Um, so I think that uh, that's my first emergency. The second emergency I find is going to the waiting room and seeing far too many patients. That's my second emergency. But the talk that I'll cover uh, really is around the Parkinson uh, uh, me um, medical clinical emergencies that we have. And um, I'm not going to limit myself just to the physical, the motor symptoms. Uh, I will put a little bit of the non-motor because I think especially uh, those people living with patients who have Parkinson's disease uh, can be very, very disturbed by those um, sorts of uh, complications. But I'm going to break my talk down uh, into a, a series of topics. And I think uh, the first area that I'm going to aim to cover is where there's a worsening, a sudden worsening of existing Parkinson's symptoms. And so we see this uh, commonly in clinical practice. And one of the things I try and emphasize with patients is that Parkinson's disease is generally a pretty slow process. You know, cells are dying off in the brain uh, at a very um, typically uh, steady uh, rate. And what that means is that if there's a sudden change, so if you suddenly realize that your Parkinson's physical symptoms are much worse 
it is usually something that has triggered that rather than it's a, a worsening acutely of your Parkinson's disease. So what we're really talking about here is find that thing that got worse. So have you got a new medication that the doctor has started for your Parkinson's disease? Has somebody stopped a Parkinson's medication? Has somebody added a medication that's not for your Parkinson's disease, but it might be interacting with your other uh, medications and causing you either to have too much or too little movement? And then the sort of second tier, as it were, is, is there another process going on? So many patients with Parkinson's disease will struggle with things like constipation or from time to time will get water, you know, urine tract infections. And so these concomitant illnesses can definitely impact upon Parkinson's and make the physical symptoms much worse, sometimes looking undertreated, sometimes getting those involuntary movements of dyskinesia that Raj just talked about. The next area I'll move on to um, is a very specific couple of syndromes. And so the, uh, the most important of those is a thing that we call the Parkinsonism hyperpyrexia syndrome. This is something that we take very seriously because if it happens to our patients, it does uh, have a, a small risk of death. And certainly these patients need very intensive management, indeed possibly going into intensive care. And in this condition, Patients get a very uh, rapid uh, increase in their physical Parkinsonism, so they're slow and stiff, and they also get an elevation of their temperature, so they run a fever. And the triggers for this uh, presentation are often having missed their own Parkinson medications, or somebody's added a drug that interacts with those medications. So we're going to cover a bit about that. The second specific syndrome that I'll touch upon is far less common and thankfully a little bit less dangerous, and that's a thing called the serotonin syndrome. Again, we heard a little bit about serotonin being a neurotransmitter in the brain, and we think of it in, in, uh, in terms of what else it can do away from the physical serotonin, often they're implicated in how your mood is, how you sleep is. But we do know that um, depression uh, is common in Parkinson's patients, and therefore antidepressant medications which target the serotonin system are important. And they're really important because sometimes Parkinson medications can interact with those drugs and cause a similar syndrome to what we see with uh, the Parkinson hyperparexia syndrome, where people become acutely unwell and need to be intensively managed so that they don't get worse. I'm also going to, going to stray across into what do we do about people who are like that and how do we manage them acutely, but also some of the rescue therapies. So when patients experience a failure in their medication, so uh, this feeling as though the tablets aren't working, where patients are switched off. And so we're going to talk a little bit about some of the uh, mechanisms that doctors can use to try and reverse those off periods. Some of them we've had for quite a number of years, such as injectable products like apomorphine, um, and some of them are a little bit more uh, recent, um, so inhaled products, and people are also talking about intranasal products and under the tongue sublingual products that might improve those, uh, those periods and more rapidly bring patients back into their uh, better treated condition rather than waiting for the tablets to kick in. Um, on the flip side, uh, we also see too much involuntary movement. Uh, we saw a little bit of this again from Raj's talk about dyskinesia and how we uh, deal with patients who have got these excessive movements. I'll then go into a section uh, briefly covering non-physical, so things like psychosis, delusions, confusion, delirium. Um, which are common accompaniments, especially when Parkinson drugs go wrong um, because you either had too much or you've got an intercurrent illness and you may have come out of surgery. So we're going to talk about how we deal with those things and the common problem of fainting. So people with low blood pressure in Parkinson's and how we manage that. And then finally, uh, what I'm going to uh, talk about is uh, the, uh, the, when, when the hardware goes wrong. So in those patients with advanced disease who are on a device-assisted therapy, either having had surgery on the brain with the electrodes in place, or if they have a pump therapy, such as an apomorphine delivering uh, the drug under the skin via a small pump, or a uh, 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 levodopa, carbidopa, intestinal gel, so the sort of gel preparation of your tablets, which goes via a tube into your stomach and then you're into your intestine. These things have all got hardware issues. So, for example, 
Does the battery work with your deep brain stimulation? Have you managed to fall and break the electrode that goes up to supply the brain with the, uh, the energy that's needed? Has the pump failed? Is the tube blocked? And what happens when patients present like that and, and how we might manage it? So it'll be a smorgasbord, a smorgasbord of, uh, of different problems that we see uh, in clinical practice with hopefully some very practical tips to help patients and their loved ones. So I'm very much looking forward to it. Thank you, Simon. That was uh, really helpful. If anyone has any questions who are listening in, feel free to type them in the chat box and we'll be happy to answer them. And um, let me ask you a question, Simon. Th this idea of emergencies and Parkinson's, you really touched on this idea that Parkinson's doesn't get worse over a day or a few days and that we always should look for other, other ways. When should patients think about calling their clinicians if they're having a problem, that they might have some medical problem going on? Look, I think it's a really good point, um, Stu. I think the truth is that a lot of patients feel that they don't want to disturb the doctor. Uh, there may be other implications, um, financially or otherwise. But I think the truth is with medicine, you know, the, the old adage is that prevention is better than the cure. And if we can get in early, we often find that, you know, we can do things a little bit more effectively. So, for example, uh, you know, if you have a patient who um, suddenly uh, overnight becomes confused, their Parkinson's is worse, they may be um, getting agitated, they may have involuntary movements. And that may, you know, be the early sign of, let's say, a water infection. Now, a simple test at the, the local doctors, um, just like a dipstick to see whether there's an infection there, means that you can already um, get you uh, onto some treatment. If that treatment isn't started then, what you're going to see is a, 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 a more generalized infection, what we in the, the trade call a septicemia. So now you have a patient who's gone from being a little bit ill and their Parkinson medications aren't working properly to being quite ill. So they might become dehydrated, their blood pressure drops, they may get a spread of infection to affect the kidneys. Now you've gone from a situation where you might need to go from tablets, antibiotics, to, to intravenous uh, antibiotic therapies. And that, you know, you're, you're really escalating the game. And these patients now go from being managed in the outpatient scenario to often needing to be an inpatient in the hospital. And um, because those things are associated with the worsening of the physical symptoms, people falling over. And, you know, if you're trying to manage this at home and you've left it for a couple of days, you know, the next thing you're looking at is, well, my husband broke his hip because of a water infection. And you kind of go, well, that could have been avoided. So I think most of us uh, would rather hear early um, I think the truth is that most emergency departments are happy to see a patient who comes in with these acute problems. And to be honest, most of the time, you know, by the time you've screened for a water infection, constipation, a chest infection, and run some blood tests to make sure that nobody's added a tablet that has changed the salt balance in the blood, you can solve probably the vast majority of these cases very quickly. So I think that's, you know, don't hesitate is, is the rule. But I tell you what, Sue, I'm very excited to know what you're going to talk about in Kyoto. So what are you going to be presenting? Well, so we're going to be talking about off periods and off time and really specifically treatments of offs. And it's an important topic because this word off is not intuitive. Off really came about in, uh, from, from doctors who made up words that may not have a whole lot of sense. Uh, when we think about what medications do and what Parkinson's does. The word off means that the effect of a dose of levodopa is no longer present and that symptoms have reemerged. And when we have these symptoms that reemerge, they can be both motor symptoms like tremor and slowness and trouble getting out of a chair or walking or talking or writing, or they could be what we call non-motor symptoms. And these are symptoms that can include anxiety, uh, slower thinking, uh, feeling of anxiety, pain, ache, tingling, and all these symptoms can emerge when the benefit of a dose of levodopa begins to wane and the symptoms begin to reemerge. And there's no longer a need to really have to wait for those symptoms to get worse and worse and worse when we want to have so many different ways of trying to address them. We know that these types of off symptoms are very, very common. And it's been estimated that while initially in the first two or three or four or five years, there's a so-called honeymoon period where levodopa works very consistently. But after a bit of time, three or five or seven years, these off periods begin to emerge and symptoms come back. And it's so important for 
our patients and their families to recognize these symptoms and talk about them to their doctors and nurses so that they can be addressed because we have good treatments nowadays to try to keep these symptoms at bay. Probably about half of our patients will develop these types of off periods within five years and somewhere between 70 and 90% within 10 years. So they're very, very frequent and they probably occur um, two or more times a day in, in, in most people, yet they may be under-recognized unless we're really thinking about that. Sometimes we use diaries to bring them out. And we also think about the total time in a waking day, maybe 15 or 16 hours people are awake. And we really want most of those hours to be a good on effect of the medication, a good on time, and not having excessive off time and not having excessive dyskinesia time. And we can only accomplish that by really understanding when these times are, com are coming. So we want our patients and their families to take notes the day or two before a visit, or we have some new wearables that we're using, things that can go on the wrist, for example, and see when patients have a response to the medicine and when the medicine's working and not working. Uh, we have a lot of these wearables that are being evaluated in research programs. And we've also done a lot of research and understanding better about why these off periods occur. We know that the brain loses the ability to store dopamine as time goes on and more dopamine is needed. And we also know that when we take levodopa to become dopamine, it has to be swallowed and go into the stomach and into the GI tract and the intestines. And we know that those are also slow in Parkinson's. For example, constipation is very common, but so is slow stomach emptying and absorption of levodopa can be delayed or not be full enough to give a full improvement of symptoms every dose. So it's really a combination of how the brain handles dopamine and how we administer by having a pill, an oral form of medicine be swallowed through a part of the uh, body, the GI system, where Parkinson's may actually begin and certainly affects and slows the absorption. So we have to think about all these ideas and understand that when a dose of medication is taken, it begins to work sometimes in 20 minutes, but sometimes it may be delayed. And there may be a delayed onset of medication. It may last 30 or 40 or 50 minutes before it begins to work. And it may work for several hours before a symptom begins to occur, non-motor or motor. And we call this a waning of the on, the beginning of off, uh, early uh, wearing off effect at the end of the dose. And these will continue to increase until the next dose is taken and begins to work. So we think about all the treatment options we have nowadays. We think about these different ways that we can see a change in how the response of being always on now gets interrupted by these off periods. And when we in take all these off periods throughout the day, we add them up and that gives us what we call off time in the day. And many people have several hours or more of off time during the day. So we really wanna to try to address this. And there's several ways that we can talk about, and we'll go into these in detail in Kyoto, but briefly now, just to recognize that the levodopa pills can be taken at higher doses. They can be taken closer together if they don't last long enough. We can use a longer acting form of levodopa. There's a number of different preparations around the world where levodopa and carbidopa have been formulated to be released on a more time-dependent scale. We can try to add medicines that prevent the breakdown of dopamine in the brain, MAOB inhibitors, for example, or that allow more levodopa to get into the brain, what we call COMP inhibitors. And we've heard a little bit already today about the use of infusions. Subcutaneous infusion pumps are being evaluated uh, for levodopa. We have them available already for apomorphine. And there's also levodopa infusions directly into the gut that bypasses the slowness of the stomach that can give people an on effect that's more continuous. And of course, you've heard about some surgical options. But there's also another class of medications that can be used by our patients on demand as needed when an off period occurs. Whereas these other medications, the MLB inhibitors and the COMPT inhibitors, and also the class of medicines that mimic dopamine called dopamine agonists can improve the overall off time throughout the day we have non-oral medicines that have been evaluated and some are available now that can specifically stop an off period and allow a patient to turn back into the on state. And these are non-oral to try to bypass the slowness of the stomach and emptying the medicine into the intestine where it's absorbed and where protein can interfere with the absorption. 
So we have, for example, a subcutaneous injection of a dopamine agonist called apomorphine. Uh, we have available now in the States inhaled uh, version of levodopa that bypasses the stomach. We have in development a number of other non-oral formulations that can be absorbed uh, beneath the tongue, for instance, uh, apomorphine and other ones that are being developed now, recognizing that there's two sides uh, that we have to address if we want to improve off periods and off time. We want to make things last longer in the brain and have it get in there more readily. We also want to try to have a remedy when the next dose is going to take too long to work by giving a non-oral medicine that can be injected or inhaled or absorbed in some other way. So those are some of the highlights of, of what we're going to be talking about in terms of off time and off periods, as well as some of the treatment options uh, for these problems. Well, that sounds amazing. Um, can I ask both yourself and Raj to comment on something that I think is common? And that is a phenomenon that I call levodopaphobia. And that is the problem that patients have where they look on the internet and they read bad things about levodopa and they think, gosh, I don't want to take this tablet because I'm going to end up with these horrible movements. What, what is it that we should be telling our patients? What does is, what is the evidence base tell us about how safe this drug is, what sort of things that you know we should be looking for or doing for our patients. Perhaps, Stu, if you want to say that first and then Raj, maybe after I... Yeah. Yeah, well, I think it's an important point because you know the, the symptoms of Parkinson's, the motor symptoms especially, reflect this loss of dopamine in the brain. And levodopa becomes dopamine. It's almost like putting gasoline in an automobile and being able to have the engine which is otherwise fine and working, functioning fine, but doesn't have enough gasoline. The brain works pretty fine, but doesn't have enough dopamine. We have to replace dopamine. And we have a number of trials over many, many decades that suggest that the sooner we begin to replace dopamine in a Parkinson's brain, the better that brain will function, not only in the short term, but also in the long term. And while we don't want to give too much medicine, as you suggest some people fear, we also want to give too little medicine. The right amount of medicine is the right amount. We don't want to give too much or too little. We want to give the right amount because the brain normally has the right amount of dopamine. So we tend to think now that we want to begin medicine sooner and try to replace it to more normal levels by judging by the symptoms and not giving too much, but not giving too little either and not delaying it too long. So, you know, just to follow up on Stu, I, I think if we look at it in general in, in our clinics, majority of our patients are undertreated. And the reason I say that, because when we do clinical trials for off time, we find patients who have six hours of off time at baseline, and they're relatively easy to recruit. On the other hand, when we try to recruit patients for a dyskinesia study, we have found that their off time is only three hours, but they're much more difficult to recruit because there are not that many people taking enough medication to be on most of the time. Like I said, we could pretty much eliminate on uh, off time if we just gave enough levodopa, but the challenge is the dyskinesias. And this goes down to, like you suggested, partly levodopa phobia that is there. And I don't think it's just the patients. I think it's also a number of clinicians out there. Uh, and from the patient standpoint, it starts with, well, I want to save it. I, I want to save it when I really need it. And the problem is that I always tell my patients, well, if we start today, well, maybe you'll get dyskinesias in five years. But if we wait five years, well, you may get it in six months. So it's not going to give you another five years. And for the five years you don't take it, you're going to be struggling uh, with your daily activities, whatever it might be. The other thing is I think physicians often put it up to the patients to say, you tell me when you need the medication. And you know, from the patient standpoint, it often goes down to, well, you know, today I, I'm shaking a little bit and my doctor said, I don't need it, I'll wait. And pretty soon they have difficulty buttoning it and their spouse is buttoning it. Well, it doesn't matter to me, I'm okay. And pretty soon they're using a cane and they're like, I'm 70 years old, I gotta use a cane sometime. So I think putting this on the patient who really doesn't have our background or our experience is another big issue that happens with levodopaphobia. And I think we need to explain to the patient with the data we have, that you are going to be struggling for the few years if you hold back levodopa. The other change that has occurred 
is that we have medications that can help dyskinesias. Whether we look at amantadine, whether we look at deep brain stimulation, whether we look at infusion therapies, and 20 years ago, we didn't have all this. So I think we also need to be aware that we have better treatment options. So that itself should also hopefully cut down on some of the phobia that the patients have had. It may not be very unlike a, a disease, say diabetes, where insulin is lacking and we have to replace insulin to normal levels and we don't want to give too much nor too little. And there's not much difference in Parkinson's. There. We want to try to regulate dopamine, certainly, and not give too much, but not give too little either. It's also sure. remarkable that some of the things we fear that you've pointed out today that can occur as we treat Parkinson's over time that some have ascribed to too much dopamine turns out uh, to be due to other chemicals as well. Uh, hallucinations probably reflects an overactivity of serotonin in combination with dopamine and dyskinesia and overactivity of glutamate. And orthostatic hypotension doesn't just reflect dopamine, but also reflects the loss of noradrenaline and norepinephrine. So as we learn more about Parkinson's, I think we can translate that into new strategies of trying to replace dopamine sooner and, and keep it more level. So Simon, you brought up earlier about hyperparaxia and Parkinsonism as being one of our big emergencies, but something very similar, kind of similar, I should say, it's serotonin syndrome, where most of our patients are on SSRIs, SNRIs, uh, and especially in, in US, if we put them on an MAOB, we get a call from a pharmacist saying that, oh, you're going to cause your patient to have serotonin syndrome. But, but how common are these uh, both neuroleptic uh, hyperparaxia Parkinsonism and serotonin that, that we should really be concerned about? So I, um, I agree. Um, there are actually automated systems for prescribing uh, which actually flag for the chemist, the pharmacist, that you know the combination of some of our drugs, the monoamine oxidase inhibitors, and these SSRIs, the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, is a bad combination. And I have to be honest and say that I think uh, the, uh, the the data here is is actually quite um, uh, good and reassuring for the clinician. And I, I must confess that I prescribe a lot of um, patients. Uh, I generally use an SNRI, so targeting both serotonin and noradrenergic pathways and combine it with those other Parkinson drugs without problem. Now, interestingly, we can be reassured a little bit because just last year, uh, a paper came out which looked at the number of cases of serotonin syndrome, uh, looking at those patients who are on those medications and really reported it was uh, less than 0.01% of cases that will actually develop a serotonin syndrome. And in that uh, publication, there were no reported fatalities. Um, so I think we should be uh, much more aggressive about treating mood disorder and just reassuring our patients that uh, this is unlikely to happen. Um, but they should be able to monitor for it. The, uh, you know, the, the, the serotonin syndrome it does come on um, sort of subacutely over a day or two where it happens, and it, uh, it generally is something that uh, patients will notice that they're feeling more in the way of their Parkinson's. And I think, you know, simply monitoring their blood pressure at home can be a good screen. The figures on the Parkinsonism hyperparexia syndrome are a little bit higher, and the incidence there is uh, reported at 0.3%. That's quite a, an old study now, but uh, it's uh, certainly more common than the serotonin syndrome. Um, but I think its number is actually reducing as we become more familiar with the medication combinations that we should put together. So uh, many years ago, I guess, when patients were starting to develop problems such as psychosis, delusions, we may have been tempted to reach into the, the, um, the uh, psychiatrist's drug box and pick drugs that might block dopamine systems and trigger off these behaviors. And certainly the, the rate of fatalities um, that has been reported in these um, uh, PHS, Parkinson's and Hyperexia syndromes, it is reported around 4% when you get that syndrome. So certainly it's one of those things that we have to take very seriously, but it's not um, something that should make our patients stop um, uh, their medications or panic about what they're doing. I think you know, we just need to have good communication um, with our patients and also our pharmacists. Yeah, definitely. So can I pick up the button again, Stu, and, and ask you, um, 
With regards to the off periods, I think you uh, mentioned that there was uh, uh, some wearable devices for the physical symptoms, but what are the clues when people should find out what the non-motor, those sort of anxiety, pain, what are the, what are the clues for a family to be listening out for? You go and get an app there a bit. So about the non-motor symptoms? Yeah. How, the, how can people listening to their partner say, oh, look, I think actually this is related to the tablet wearing off when they get anxiety and pain. What should they be listening for? So I think it's, it's really important to recognize that these off periods contain and are characterized both by motor and non-motor symptoms. And much like tremor can occur even when the medicine's working, if someone becomes agitated watching a movie or, or something happens and causes some anxiety, tremor might emerge. We're really looking for symptoms that occur when the medicine effect begins to wane. And that could be tremor or it could be slowness, but it could also be anxiety and it could be a slower thinking. And what we want to know is when symptoms occur as the medicine effect is beginning to be lost and off periods begin and get worse and worse until the next dose works and then go away. So medicines that respond to levodopa uh, are going to be important things, clues to know when the levodopa medicines, the carbidopa levodopa is working and when the effect is, is not working. So I think we always want to try to find those particular symptoms and they're different for each patient. And that's, I think, the key. So there's a question that has come up and, and maybe I'll put it up to both of you. Are there any animal models where affected animals respond to levodopa similar to humans, i.e. having temporary improvement of motor skills and demonstrate off time, for example, when, animal, when uh, animals are fed proteins. So what about animal models for uh, uh, improvement in symptoms as well as off time? So Sue, I don't know if you want to take that, but I'll, I'll have a go at the first part first. Um, I, uh, I mean, I think that uh, we have models where essentially, I think that models are a bit limited in Parkinson's disease, but I think when we're talking about symptom benefits, they, they have a role. So the models that we have will often take an animal um, and use a toxin, um, a poison to kill the dopamine cells in the brain. And that, if you like, gives us a model of how off periods uh, model and therefore how symptomatic therapies to restore dopamine can help. Similarly, there are models, um, mainly primates, uh, around um, inducing dyskinesias. So again, taking a toxin model, taking the dopamine system out, and then using increasingly high doses to uh, create these involuntary movements in a primate. So we do have those simple models, and that has helped us to uh, evaluate medications that are out there. Um, I'm less convinced, um, and maybe it's in the protein phobia um, uh, uh, base about the impact of uh, protein in the diet on uh, the, the medications that our patients talk about. Um, the fact of the matter is, I think in uh, advanced disease, when people are struggling with absorption of their medications because their stomach isn't working a little bit like we've heard about, uh, the, um, the truth is that uh, you know we, we probably uh, do advise our patients to try and take things on an empty stomach, avoid the protein load. But I think it's probably overdone and I, I'm not aware uh, of very good evidence where we've done those experiments and said how bad is the Parkinson's when you take it with this much protein that much protein I don't know whether you guys have any thoughts on that so I I would agree with you I think the protein or with meals is a very over uh, concerning or oversold phenomena so to speak I mean I usually tell my patients especially early on when they first start levodopa take it with food even though the pharmacist is going to put a sticker set, take it on an empty stomach because it is you need to tolerate it before you worry about it being empty on an empty stomach or not. And like you said, it's really maybe 10% of the patients in advanced disease where they themselves figure it out very easily. Oh, if I take something with it, I'm going to be off. But I, I think 80 to 90% of them really don't have enough of a fluctuation with protein that they actually report that. What do you think, Stu? I agree. I think, you know, the levodopa is absorbed through the same large neutral amino acid transporter that protein is absorbed from, but there usually is not a big effect except in a, probably 10 or 20% of people and they have a tuna fish sandwich or a large steak or chicken meal, they'll notice some a blunting of the response to levodopa, which can be corrected either by separating the protein or by taking a little higher dose of levodopa to compete right. with 
protein, uh, which is another which is another way. Um, so here's so here's a question I, that, that's come up uh, again. We, we we talk a lot about patients who have off periods and off time, and then we talk about other patients who have dyskinesia. But I think as we're learning from a lot of recent uh, trials, the same people, the same people have off time and dyskinesia, depending on how much levodopa they take. And maybe we need to be talking about these things together of how to treat uh, off time and dyskinesia, trying to keep people in a good on time. Maybe the concept is not how much off time should a patient have, but how much on time, good on time do they have on time without dyskinesia? Sort of do a Goldilocks factor. Your Goldilocks factor is that you're right in the nice zone, you're not too much, not too little. It's, it's a very good point. And one of the questions I see that's come up, Stu, which for you, I think, um, says, you know, well, what's acceptable? How much off time is acceptable? And, you know, is it then just a simple, oh, well, just take the nasal spray and it's fixed? I think it's, you know, not all off time is the same. And there's off periods that occur that may last oh, an hour, but be very mild. And there's off periods that may occur that only last 20 minutes, but be severe and people could be immobile and having panic attacks. So it really has to do that when the symptoms occur to recognize they're not really symptoms of Parkinson's disease. They're symptoms of the medication effect no longer being present at an off period beginning, and it will continue till the next dose works. And what happens then? How does that off period affect function and daily activities? If people are starting to curtail their activities, exercise, going out to a, a lunch, not planning travel, seeing a family member is because they fear having an off period, then it ought to be treated because off periods can be treated nowadays with all of the different medications we have. So I, I basically put it up as that if the off is bothering the patient to whatever extent it might be, and we know every patient has a different uh, threshold for what becomes bothersome, I, I would treat it. If my patient told me, yeah, I get a little bit more tremor 20 minutes before the next dose, uh, it doesn't affect me. I, I'm not gonna push them to treat it from that part. So the, another question that has come up, Stu, and maybe you should take it again, is that is there treatment now with new nose no spray? I think they mean is the uh, orally inhaled levodopa. I think that's the latest thing that was approved. You want to give a couple of uh, a quick response to that? Sure. So so while protein may not be a major factor for a lot of people, it is for some. But importantly to recognize is that the Nerves that surround the gut are affected in Parkinson's. There's some data that suggests Parkinson's may uh, early affect the gut, even before motor symptoms occur. And because of this, when a pill is swallowed, it may take some time to get through the esophagus. It may sit in the stomach for an extended period of time. And it can't work until it gets out of the stomach and into the small intestine, the part that absorbs amino acids and proteins where levodopa is absorbed. So in people who notice that sometimes they take and swallow carbidopa, levodopa, and it works in 20 minutes, but some doses, it may take 40 minutes or an hour or two hours. They need to have something that they can use that doesn't get swallowed and can avoid this problem with absorption when pills are swallowed. And that's why it's important to know that there are medications available, depending on where you live in the world, that can be injected subcutaneously, morphine that can be inhaled, uh, just inhaled through the mouth, but it's inhaled levodopa that's in the States now. Um, and the other formulations uh, may be absorbed beneath the tongue for apomorphine and lots of other medicines being explored in research programs, which is so important to try to advance Parkinson's treatment and find new treatments to help people do better that will bypass the problems we have in the GI tract of swallowing medicine and get them in more directly, directly into the bloodstream and quickly into the brain. So Simon, I see you have a question here. Are there specific risk factors for hyperparaxia syndrome? Yes, there are. Um, so generally, I think patients with more advanced disease are su subject to this uh, syndrome rather than, uh, if you like, patients who are younger um, and have more mild disease. And, and really the issue is about an abrupt change or, uh, or lack of 
the dopamine stimulation. So patients who may be non-compliant, um, so for example, if someone is unwell and they stop taking their medication, if they become unwell uh, or maybe post-surgically and they can't take their medication and have an infection so the tablets aren't as well absorbed, or if they're given a drug that can block dopamine, those would be the major risks that would trigger one of those Parkinson's and hyperparexia syndromes. So I think those are the main things. And I, I can see another uh, couple of questions that have come through here, which uh, are really asking a, a similar question, both of dyskinesia and off periods. What about the role of exercise? Raj, can you exercise yourself to a better Goldilocks state where you're not under or over treated? Well, uh, you know, uh, if exercise could fix everything, I think that would be great. We wouldn't need pills. But I think exercise has a role, but I don't think we are at a stage we can say exercise can replace medication. Uh, if you look at dyskinesias, there are no specific exercises that are going to reduce dyskinesias. Of course, you may exercise and use up more of the dopamine, and, and that may indirectly reduce dyskinesias. And the question of, uh, you know, what about exercising during an off period or during an on period? We actually tried to do a study on patients should really exercise during their on time because that's when they are on and when they are doing well. But again, no one has done a specific study that I'm aware of comparing exercising during off or on. To me, exercising during off would be that you already have so much weight on, you're working twice as hard to get there, whereas working in your on state is the best time for, for one to exercise. So, so for me, yes, exercise has a role, doesn't replace medication, but I would say there are no specific exercises for dyskinesias. Yeah, and, I, and I would add that exercise makes the medicines work better, and the medications make exercise work better. They really go hand in hand, and you can't replace one without the other. Here's a question for something that uh, you brought up, Rob. Uh, and a patient writes this in uh, today in the chat. Someone who's had motor symptoms for a year or so. When do you start levodopa? Do you wait until the symptoms are troublesome? What does troublesome mean? How long do you wait? How soon do you start it? And does right. it really matter, considering the recent LEAP study? Right. So again, I, when we were talking about levodopa phobia, I didn't mean that as soon as people are diagnosed that they should start levodopa. It still goes down to is how bothersome the symptoms are for a person. I mean, if, if I have a little bit of a thumb tremor, which I barely notice it, it comes once in a while when I'm maybe watching the World Cup out there, I, I may say maybe we don't need to be treated. But on the other hand, if the tremor is at an issue that I could lose my job or I don't go out and meet people, then definitely that needs to be treated. So I think, again, what is functional impairment is dependent on that individual. But at the same time, if a person is not able to walk, is falling, is tripping, uh, I think they definitely need the levodopa, or if, if they're having difficulty with other activities, they definitely need it. But at the same time, if the symptoms are so very little that, that they barely notice it, no, maybe they can wait for some time. Yeah, I think those early symptoms really are like a balloon, and they slowly come in from 100% to 95 to 90. Don't wait until they're affecting your life. Take medicine. But if they're not affecting your life, you don't need medicine. But sooner rather than later probably is a good idea. Yeah, that would be a good way to put it, Stu. So I guess this really uh, wraps up some of the highlights we wanted to bring about the symposium we'll have at the World Parkinson's Congress that's run by the WPC, the World Parkinson's Coalition. And um, if you're not able to make it to Kyoto, please tune in for more of these uh, webinars to highlight some of the exciting information that will be presented in Kyoto. Uh, we look forward to seeing uh, any of you who make it to Kyoto next week. And uh, we thank Kyoto Kieran again for making this webinar possible. An archive of this webinar will be made available shortly for those of you who wish to watch it again or to tell a friend about it who wants to tune in and watch it. We thank you for joining us and thank you, uh, Dr. Power and Professor Lewis for, for joining us today and talking about these important uh, problems. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed.